good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the PE Forum webinar series on perspectives on digital disruption uh, in logistics. Uh, we have uh, three amazing speakers with us today. Uh, Hussein Mohebe, CEO of uh, Fetcher, a cloud technology platform focused on the last mile delivery. Uh, Jana Dian Dalmia, JD, uh, founder and CEO of Trucking, a digital trucking platform aggregator empowering uh, shippers, transporters, truck drivers uh, for, for the sector, uh, as well as Dr. Hossam Jamili, uh, partner, leader, digital tech practice uh, at Bain and Company. Uh, we're going to go through three main topics. The first one being looking at the technology impact of the sector within the five years and uh, uh, beyond five years, debunking some of the myths we're all hearing. The second sector will look at uh, the competitive landscape uh, and how does it play out with legacy player or incumbents with the new startups uh, and new entrants as well. And trying to answer if it is a winner take all market like some other digital uh, sectors. And finally, we want to look at the future of logistics tech in the region, answering what is needed from, from governments and how will uh, ECG as well impact uh, the business. So I will start with uh, you, uh, Hussein. Uh, please, if you could give us a, a global outlook uh, on the uh, sector and how technology um, uh, is, is uh, impacting it. I think we are today in a, in a very exciting uh, time frame, an inflection point for the industry in, in many ways. Um, let me start, you know, kicking off with, with a few facts. As we've seen, the last uh, couple of years has seen a resurgence, a big growth of the of the logistics sector. Uh, if we look at, uh, you know, the growth rates over the last few years, you know, uh, Kager wise between eight ten percent um, uh, across the board. If we look at uh, the largest market in the region, the Saudi market has reached roughly hundred billion rials in terms of of uh, market of market size for logistics and logistics services. So, uh, by all means, an attractive uh, segment to be in and an attractive timing. I think we've seen also, uh, at the same time, the need to transform and adapt. Most players in the region and globally had to adopt new business models driven by new technologies, obviously, but also by many more trends uh, evolving around the customer needs. And therefore, it is triggering a transformative uh, uh, journey across uh, different dimensions of the business. And let me just shed li light on a few of them, uh, Khaled, as you highlighted, mostly around technological trends, but also beyond that. And, and first, if I, you know, quickly on the supply demand side the equation in the Middle East, you can see that we are expecting a surge on the, on the production side. So both in terms of industrials, as well as consumer goods, resurging now from the COVID crisis, we're expecting really a resurgence overall in volumes of, of the logistics across uh, different markets. However, at the same time, we're seeing also a bit of a cost pressure because uh, if you look at the drivers and specialized labor forces, in particular by driven by the new technological requirements and the new skills and, and, and types of profiles we're looking for, that might be as well, uh, you know, kind of putting some pressure on the cost side, uh, let alone the oil prices, which are have been retracing recently, but remain volatile and, and uh, also are, are subject to further increases. Now, the ecosystem itself, which is driven by lots of technologies, one of which obviously and the most prominent is the proliferation of e-commerce, which has pushed, and, and of, co of course, you know, we can talk uh, for, about e-commerce uh, alone, but I would focus more on the implications for the logistics players, which has pushed them to, shifted them to mo focus more, less so on the B2B side and the B2B2C and more towards the B2C. The customer is the end customer is the the, the king. Uh, increasing cost and operational efficiency and complexity requirements, COVID has further accelerated this trend. Uh, customer preferences, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, evolve around that, which you know things around uh, faster, flexible delivery options, real time visibility. Uh, you know, coupled as well with the previous requirements from the B two B customers of logistics players around you know higher service levels, price transparency, and so on make that equation B2C, B2B uh, very hard to, to uh, you know, kind of manage. We expect a further growth of 3PLs. 3PLs have been, uh, you know, they've proven their ability to deliver across all these different dimensions at a lower cost than many uh, companies which have tried to deliver this in-house. So that would be interesting. But at the same time, in a big increase in competition across, you know, new entrants, uh, the e-commerce players themselves actually going into uh, logistics and fulfillment 
startups in different uh, parts of the value chain, and we have two great representatives today with us. Uh, you know, they can be crowdsourcing, delivery platforms, online brokers, you name it. And then most notably the digital technologies, Khaled, that you highlighted. We see, you know, IoT, we see advanced analytics, we see automation. We also see new delivery vehicles, autonomous vehicles, drones, et cetera, which will uh, replace traditional interhaul and last mile delivery options. Therefore, bringing much more, you know, complexity into the system as well as raise further and actually contribute to the further expectation of the customers now, now, precisely where I am, real-time visibility of the delivery value chain, et cetera. Now, add to that two last factors, and I will uh, stop here with my overall uh, perspective on the sustainability part. So we expect that concerns around environmental impact and the climate change will increase delivery costs. Uh, for example, the carbon taxing we've seen in many markets. Uh, as well as expectations from consumers on, on environmentally friendly concepts. And, and that would be one of potentially of the preference choices for the consumers. And then last but not least, uh, on the regulatory side, we've seen, uh, you know, of course, trade uh, wars, trade agreements being uh, undone and so on. Emergence of, of uh, shipping regulations. So all this will obviously put a certain pressure on, on the legislation from a legislation point of view on the cost of doing business in the logistics world. And, and th these are things that have to be taken care of. In our region, uh, we also see issues between the GCC uh, borders, uh, delays in the implementation of the common uh, custom agreements among the GCC countries and the one market concept, which uh, of course will exas exasperate further the ease of doing logistics and the ease of, uh, and the cost of the logistical uh, value chain. Uh, thank you. I, I mean, building on what you, you said, I'd like to, to move on with Hussein. And what I would like to, to check with you is that we, we've seen all the issues that we're facing. Is there really a room for uh, technology anymore in, in, let's say, last mile delivery until we, we get uh, automated uh, unmanned vehicles or whatever? What is uh, Fetcher doing? What is the technological aspect that puts you, you would, I would say, at an advantage and help you find some of the solutions uh, to the problems that uh, Hussein has just uh, mentioned. Yeah, thank you, Khaled. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Well, to answer the question, uh, basically, we did not start yet as an industry. I can tell you that we are in the very early stages of transformation. Uh, the way we need to look into this is the short term and the long term. We hear a lot about uh, drones and uh, autonomous vehicles, you know, and, and electric cars and everything. However, for me personally, uh, I see these uh, on a very long term because of regularity challenges that you have in countries, because of the readiness of those uh, uh, technologies or th those tools that will take you to another level of logistics. Today, I believe that short-term transformation is about moving from the traditional way of manually integrating and doing the last mile or the end-to-end -end logistics into a more uh, tech-enabled logistics end-to-end -end process. At Fetcher, for example, today Fetcher is a company, it's a tech-enabled logistics company. It is a technology company that stepped into the logistics industry and has a combination of both. It has the combination today of the best experienced people in the industry from a logistics perspective who bring the traditional basics of logistics and they have the tools which maybe big players don't have or not, not big players have, which is the advanced technologies that enable us to become more efficient, to improve the customer experience and to optimize our costs and, and, and operations. So when you talk about technology today, as a short term, machine learning and artificial intelligence are maybe the two biggest headlines here, because this will bring you into something called also a predictive technology, which allows you, if you say, I want to improve my customer experience, you cannot keep calling the customer on the phone and asking him or her, where are you today? Uh, today, we're taking this to the next level by the WhatsApp bots, by the super bots, by predicting where the customer is today. So if I always deliver to Khaled between four to six and he is in the gym, automatically my AI will schedule your delivery next time to your gym between that time. And the margin of error here is very low, unless we don't find you, then you can re-attack. 
but instead of disturbing you, the technology here will tell us where you will be. This is very basic, by the way, it's not rocket science. Secondly, when you talk about predictive technologies, a lot of returns today are happening in the industry. What you don't know is the cash and delivery courier business or express business is a very good value proposition in the Gulf region. However, the return rate is very high. So you have shipments coming from China, big volumes coming from China to Saudi and UAE. 20% of those are being refused when they arrive to destination. So in principle, the shipper has, or the merchant has paid a lot of money to ship those from China to Saudi and China to UAE, or even from UAE to Saudi Arabia, which is a very big lane for e-commerce. The question is, how can you reduce the losses on those merchants when the cash and delivery shipments are refused? This is where Fetcher comes in with the predictive technology that studies the profiles of the customers of those merchants and comes and tells them, you know what, these clients, their behavior is not good in terms of paying on time, being in the address on time, they change locations, they refuse parcels, don't give them the cash and delivery. If they don't give them the cash and delivery, you will save here the cost of returning those parcels to Dubai or to China. So this is very basic, as, as simple as it, as it sounds, but it can make a very big difference in improving the overall profitability of e-commerce players. In addition, again, to the customer experience, where tech helps a lot here in improving the customer. The less we contact the client, the more the client will be happy. Nobody wants 10 phone calls. Where are you now? Where's your location? Send your WhatsApp location. Why don't you automate that? Have a WhatsApp bot do that. Have AI and machine learning help you in the prediction. And then you can have a perfect last mile delivery. So, I mean, uh, it's interesting because what we understand is that for now, the, the main uh, technology that can uh, help uh, develop better and be give better service uh, lies around, let's say, machine learning and per perhaps uh, so some, some IoT for the ma last mile delivery. Uh, JD, uh, you as a platform, is it the, 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 same, uh, the same thing? Is it where you see uh, the immediate uh, enhancement in terms of services? And and, uh, and the workflows. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, building upon what um, you guys have been talking about, if you look, so we as Truckin, we are operating in the first mile and mid mile uh, of logistics. And if you think about uh, logistics as an overall ecosystem, right, from the time it begins at the first mile and it ends at the last mile, obviously, uh, you know, Fetcher is doing an amazing job with the last mile. When we look at, you know, redefining the ecosystem digitally, the question is around always, why do we need to do or what do we need to do? What is the clear impact of the digital transformation or the technology in the overall ecosystem? If you think about the first mile or the mid mile, I think this particular area of the business, uh, the technology has been, uh, the technology adoption or innovation historically has been so low that it's more of digitization model, right? Where you are actually, even if you push, let's say even 40 to 50% of digitization throughout the process, that's a massive impact. And when we look at digitization, it's more about questioning what is the clear impact? Does it increase either efficiency? Does it increase whether transparency, whether there is an improved SLA, there is cost optimization, there is inventory optimization, and clearly you know, the use uh, and ease of uh, usage for the customer. So I think when we talk about technology or digitization, I think always the question is, what are we doing and what is the measurable impact of that? And that's how we look at it. And as Hussein was saying, it's a short term versus the long term, right? And we get these questions, you know, what about this autonomous uh, truck deliveries? Yes, these are, I think, you know, futuristic things, but I don't think those are the things which are actually impacting current state of affairs or even for the next few years, right? Today, the problem statements are like basics, right? Where, where we are dealing I mean, Middle East is a great example uh, where we are dealing with multiple countries, right? So each time uh, the truck leaves and it's, you know, going through the cross border, you are going into a completely new country, right? 
uh, the you're crossing the border, the SIM cards are becoming roaming. You know, how do you track? How do you trace those things? How do you make it much more easier for the drivers uh, or the transporters to kind of, you know, uh, have a seamless journey from point A to point B? Similarly for the customers, you know, providing that the whole ecosystem uh, or from the time when they require a shipment to when it gets delivered. So, uh, and I agree to a, uh, another point where we look at ourselves as an enabler, not a disruptor. And I have been a huge proponent of this fact that, you know, trucking is not here to disrupt someone's business. We are here to enable, which has been already existing in the business, right? We are here to make it much more efficient, far more transparent, and increase the asset utilization, making it win-win for all the stakeholders. So when I think through technology, I think it's more of digitization, uh, which is which can be broken down between short term and long term, as we were discussing. And there are certain immediate requirements for the next few years. And because we are starting from so basic that even a 40, 50 percent digitization into this industry will create a massive impact for the overall ecosystem. I just want to follow up with one question on the technology side with you, because you know, there, there's uh, the, the tracking of uh, goods and uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the source of goods and the supply chain. And sometimes, you know, the, the cost, they say the cost of the goods is not worth uh, using IoT and using uh, these things. How do you see, let's say, uh, Internet of Things and uh, c connection to uh, global uh, satellite networks or whatever? impact the security of the shipments in the near future? Is this something that uh, will happen or do you see it on a much more uh, long term? I would say this is already happening and this is the area where we play on, right? I agree with you to a fact that, uh, you know, people have to consider what is the return on investment versus, you know, what we're investing in technology. And that's where I think uh, what happens is the economies of scale. When we operate at a scale, when we are serving 12 or 13 countries operating from, you know, multiple countries as a base, we are able to invest on those technologies because we can drive those efficiencies because of the scale. But you are absolutely right that, you know, if there is a player who is not operating at that scale, it's extremely hard for them to continue to invest in some of those things because there wouldn't be much of a return for that. But in terms of IoT, in terms of transparency, in terms of tracking, tracing, in terms of digitizing a lot of processes, I think these are, this is what today customers are evolving towards. And this is also a vision for most of the governments in the region. You know, this is a part of 2030 Saudi vision, you know, UAE vision. So governments are kind of supportive towards this, even the customs, the border controls, they are all moving towards it. And we are helping accelerate what they want. Okay, um, I just want to mention that if anybody wants to ask questions, you have the Q&A uh, uh, that's here for that and you can, anybody can ask question. We'll use the last 10-15 uh, minutes uh, of this hour to uh, answer uh, the different uh, questions. Uh, moving on to, to our, 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 our second, uh, there, there's the, you've men all mentioned the pressure on costing, uh, the, the competition. Uh, I'd like to uh, discuss a little bit more uh, the competition landscape today between startups and new entrants, as well as, uh, let's say, legacy player or the incumbents, if, if we call them. Uh, Hossam, I'll, I'll get back to you once again, is that how do you see this uh, in the Middle East? You know, many uh, people that, I, that we know that are investors in, in startups uh, in the logistics sector or, or, or looking at it, uh, see that there's a, a pressure on the cost side uh, and see that it is difficult to turn out a profit uh, unless you reach scale, just as J JD mentioned. How do you see all, see all this uh, panning out uh, in, our, in our region? And basically, is it a winner-take-all uh, market for you? Yeah, thank you, Khalid. I think maybe to preempt, it is definitely not a winner-takes-all. I think we're going to see a very interesting co competition kind of setup or market in, in, in the future where you have different types of collaborations and, and also building on what JD is saying, a very interesting way of defining, you know, disrupting versus basically enabling and the emergence of platforms really that, you know, connect the different dots 
in, in a potentially less effective market today to make it more effective. We've seen this in wonderfully in the mobility sector. We've seen this in the e-commerce sector. And I think logically as well, we see this pattern and the emergence of enabling platforms as well pop up uh, more prominently in the logistics market. But back to your question, I think if we, if we simplify the market landscape, maybe there are three, I would say, archetypes of players, right? The, the, the incumbent players, the big guys, uh, the 3PLs, the 4PLs, uh, who fulfill the entire value chain end to end uh, uh, and so on, on a global scale. These, these players, I think, are there to stay. They are, uh, I think they have proven their viability. They are indeed a solution for many, many situations where there's a need for logistical uh, support and solutions. Uh, the second category, and maybe we've seen a bit of uh, kind of uh, you know activity in that space, are the new entrants, the startups, uh, and I think we have two wonderful uh, examples with us on the call. But obviously, it has proliferated a lot, probably driven or inspired partially by the successes that we've seen uh, for uh, say and JD's companies. Uh, but again, we we see a big number of these, maybe excessive at this point of time. Maybe we will see a, a wave of consolidation. Maybe we will see a wave of you know, uh, some players going out of the market, et cetera. Uh, but it remains a very strong part of, of, this, of the market dynamics and, and a great enabler for the competition uh, scenario we've been talking about. And the third bucket, a very interesting bucket, probably did not come uh, so to, to, um, to bear, which is the, the non-logistics players going into logistics, right? Maybe the most prominent ones are the e-commerce players, if we see uh, Amazon and so on with their own, logistics arms uh, primarily for their own uh, needs, uh, you know, and, and we've seen even transportation companies, right? Very boring, uh, sorry, between the brackets, right? Kind of in the public transportation sector, operating limousines and buses and so on. Also eyeing uh, the logistics uh, sector, basically triggered to a very large degree as well uh, by the COVID crisis and the lack of uh, human passengers and uh, using that capacity to fulfill the alternative uh, uh, scenario of, of goods instead of transporting people. Uh, fascinating trends. We've seen literally bus companies, you know, of course, under the COVID circumstances, no passengers filling in goods and transporting these, whether within cities and across cities in the GCC. So uh, just to maybe going back to your uh, question, Khaled, I think it's a very un interesting scenario. Uh, by no means a winner takes all. Very uh, vivid uh, scenario. We're going to see combination of these different archetypes and collaboration coming to bear, where you know platforms would serve potentially the e-commerce players, as well as you know non-logistics companies, as well on the supply side. Different types of logistics companies will would be interested in such platforms. So I, I would say it's it's the age of platforms going forward in the logistics world. Uh, Hussein, uh, I mean, you, you, you also, uh, going back to what uh, Sam said about um, the e-commerce moving into, you, you kind of also empower uh, uh, nascent e-commerce businesses to uh, take off uh, the uh, worrying or, or this part of, of their business and do it uh, for them. We're seeing it globally. It's like the Shopify mentality versus the Amazon uh, mentality who, who will who will get forward for you do you see uh, uh, areas of development in the future uh, and and how do you see them look today our role uh, Khaled, is extremely important i mean we are the most important partner for any e-commerce company because we provide the final and the last experience you know here it's different there's nothing called first impression in e-commerce there's always the last impression and and what what we are doing today is, uh, I think uh, Dr. Hassam he highlighted a couple of important points here. But are we coming to disrupt, or are we coming to, as uh, JD said, are we coming to enable? We personally, as small companies who are popping up now, are more of an enablers, although we are being seen as the top disruptors for the big companies. I I work in big corporates, you know, big corporates. Which, which, uh, which our companies today are maybe at the size of their departments. And we were used to be scared from such small companies, very agile, very disruptive. They have technologies, they can move very fast. Uh, they, can, they can adapt to any, uh, COVID-19, by the way, is a big example today. COVID-19, when there was a big issue on capacity, big stress on capacity, you've seen that the small companies have done a great job, made a lot of money, and even capitalized on the crisis that maybe the, the, big, the big players couldn't do that. Platforms, in terms of platforms, the more you have platforms, 
not the last mile platform. When you talk about, you have a proper payment gateways, you have a proper, proper online enablers for the overall e-commerce end-to-end experience, and of course, returns and everything, this is where you have a perfection in the e-commerce ecosystem. But as long as the last mile part is not complete yet, which will take a lot of time still, I personally, as part of the industry, see there's a lot of work to be done. Maybe, maybe in another topic, we can talk about regulations and everything. But if the last mile is not good, you will never have a customer or returning customer who will buy from you again. No matter how much the beautiful website was, no matter how was the payment gateway very smooth, it's about last, that last moment when he or she receives their package. That's why we are really important in terms of an essential partners to those e-commerce uh, players. I just want to follow up with something with you, Hassan, is that uh, if you look at the competitive landscape, uh, and we're in a region where uh, we, we, I mean, maybe less in the coming years, but we're used to, uh, let's say, trophy assets or, or uh, large investors entering a, a sector that maybe they strategically shouldn't enter. Uh, the last mile delivery, uh, as you mentioned, is, 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 is the key part. It's, it's where there's a lot of value. But there's also a lot of competition. Uh, to right. which extent does technology really make the difference versus, uh, you know, human uh, human capital uh, being pushed forward? And how is it? How easy or difficult is it to differentiate yourself from competition? Technology today is extremely important. Uh, the the biggest advice I always give to everybody: the, I get asked ten days, ten times a day. Should we start a new uh, delivery company from scratch? Many people want to book, uh, create those map and app companies. It doesn't cost you anything. The question is, is the market ready to get more players? Number one, of course not. I always advise whoever wants to put their money, they have money and they want to invest in the transportation and the last mile and the e-commerce because this is where really the future is. You need to look into those small companies that are very much tech uh, enabled because this, the future is for such companies. It's, you will see a company with millions of employees and they have still the basic primitive tech. I cannot see those companies surviving for a long time anymore. Although you have those glorious days before, today it's all about disrupting your own self before getting disrupted by others. That's the way I see it. So I do a test and fetcher. Can I be disrupted technologically so that I can know in the coming two or three years, what's my strategy? Maybe my, my, my stress test, I call it, uh, is coming always positive. This makes me sleep at night. Everything else, uh, Khalid, today is an accessory. So technology in the last mile, in the delivery, is extremely important, even in the first and mid mile. Because if partners like JD, Trucker, uh, uh, integrate with Fetcher, they handle for me the first and the middle mile and I handed the last mile, and we are perfectly tech uh, uh, enabled together, and we have a proper integration, then it's going to be the most seamless operation you can see ever. Uh, I'll, I mean, if there's a merger that happens, I'll take my, my share of it, please, because of connecting not, the discussion. Not, not, not merger, I'm talking about doing business know, together but, as integrated. I was just joking. JD, I, I, I move t- t- towards you because you are this platform. You are this uh, aggregator that is, you know, making easier, and especially in, in our region, uh, you know, the, 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 the transportation, the trucking, it is, you mentioned some of the some of the difficulties, and maybe, in a sense, there's less willingness to enter this this uh, this market from competition. Do you feel a little bit protected, or do you feel that no, it is you, you still need to have a a a, a uh, technologic uh, advance? And I, I'm just going to follow up with a question that I mean that that uh, completes what what I want to say is that is the market ready to to accept this technology, especially when you know. Trucking in general is still old school. So uh, I think when we look at this market, you know, I think competition will always be there in whichever market you operate in, right? Whether it's from the new players or traditional players, it's how you split it and how you see uh, whatever you are operating. Even Starbucks had competition from, you know, all the coffee shops, you know, there are hundreds of pizza places and, you know, Domino's and Pizza Hut survive and there is, you know, every lane has a pizza shop. 
So question is not so much about, I think, competition here. It's about execution as well. When, the, when we discuss about questions that, you know, there could be multiple startups coming in. Yes, absolutely. You know, there are multiple startups, you know, and people enter into this field, which kind of reiterates that we are into the right business. If we were the only no one else would look into it. I'm pretty sure someone at some point we will ask this question, like, why do you see this, right? So I think, you know, from having that monopolistic mindset, even though that is very desirable to achieve in a business, it's very, very hard today, where, where the information flow is much easier compared to the past. But being said that, not everyone who starts will be able to execute. I always believe in logistics, barriers to entry is very low, but barriers to scale is very high. Technology, yes, it's a very key, but what do we do with technology? Are we getting what we need to build that model right? If, we, if, if it was just a cookie cutter technology system, then anyone can go and you know invest money and replicate that in six months time. So technology will not only be the differentiator because technology can be uh, you know replicated i think what is key is how you approach technology how you keep on innovating on that how you keep on building on that and that comes a lot from your on the ground experience right how you are actually solving the local problem you always have to go with the mindset in whichever market we operate in is that we are operating there locally even though we connect globally let's say so that is for me a key. And I always believe it's not a winner take all market at all in logistics because it's virtually impossible for one or two or 10 companies to continue to serve. I mean, the world, uh, there is DHLs of the world. So is there FedEx and UPS and TNTs and RMXs of the world, right? So this is virtually impossible for one player to do all. But yes, where I think the evolution will happen or where the next set of uh, focus would come is companies need to start focusing on their core competency, right? If someone like, if we are championing the overland transportation, that is where we really need to focus on, on the cross border, on the domestic, et cetera. If someone's focusing on last mile, that's really the area they need to champion on, right? So bringing that core competency, I think will be the key, understanding what we need to do, how we do it, and execution will ultimately define which is gonna survive, which companies will survive, which will thrive. Uh, but competition is here to stay. It's across all the industries. And I think that's healthy over a period of time. The usual, you know, the demand supply economics will kick in and survival of the fittest will be the key. Yes. Uh, uh, Hussam, on, on these topics, I just want to check to see, see with you. is like, if you look at uh, the, the, the logistics sector, it's also very uh, closely linked to the financial sector because you have goods going from one side and you have uh, uh, money going uh, the other side. Do you think that, and, and Hussein mentioned the cash on delivery issue. Do you think that uh, the digitization of the financial sector and the way of payments and uh, broader adoption uh, in, in the, the region will create and unlock new opportunities for logistic players uh, and with which other stakeholders would you see that? Uh, by all means, uh, Khaled, and I think um, as um, the gentlemen were, were, were basically putting it, it's about the customer experience end to end. And this is basically in both its aspects, the, the B2C clearly, which is at the forefront of e-commerce and other uh, similar businesses, but also the B2B, let's not forget about that. And also the, the B2G part and, and uh, how we deal with regulators and, and uh, regulatory requirements, etc. And across all these phases of the of the value chain, uh, you know there are of course financial services uh, which are required. And I think in most of the uh, uh, you know logistics platforms we've been part of or part of the design, etc., there's always a look at solutions on the B two B side, where we look at the uh, uh, trade finance solutions, uh, you know, enabled by technologies like blockchain and others, where. You know, the old days are over where, you know, as a trader or tradesman, you have to go to the bank and ask for a letter of credit, letter of guarantee and so on. It's, it's basically all out of an instant uh, solutioning. And there are many wonderful uh, companies uh, and startups providing the solution. And obviously, uh, the more clear scenarios is when it comes to the consumer side, uh, the cashless payments, the uh, 
uh, e-wallet solutions and all these things, which have been, we've been now you know, gradually being accepted in our region. We've seen also central banks allowing startups like these to, uh, you know, at least in, in some markets have uh, a trial license and, and, and waiting for them to be part of the, you know, kind of... Uh, the established scene of, of the logistics value chain. So definitely, Khaled, yes, as, as we digitize, all the components of the value chain have to be somehow digitized. And I think we've seen great examples from more advanced markets, both on the B2B financial solutions, as well as on the B2C side, so payments, trade finance, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I, I'll move on to our, our third and last uh, uh, line of discussion, which is, I mean, what what would we and we've talked about it a little bit throughout the session already. But what uh, what is needed uh, to really help this uh, sector uh, grow? Because it it's also a sector that helps the entire economy uh, grow, as as you've all outlined. Uh, Hussein, I'd like to because I know that you 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 have the chance to. Uh, advise governments is, in your view, what is needed from from government? Is it a, a, a more of a, a infrastructure building between governments? Let's say to start uh, with the GCC to make things easier, or uh, what is, in your view, uh, the the main thing that is needed really to unlock the opportunities of these sectors? Of course, uh, a lot of opportunities for governments in the region to work on, enable in order to enable more. Uh, the 2.0 version of the logistics, I, if I may call it, because after COVID-19, logistics is completely different than the, the era before. Especially now today, we are always uh, open to potential and possible crises in the future. And COVID-19 was a great stress test on the logistics infrastructure for countries in the region. Uh, I can tell you the big challenges that happened were capacity management in specific. When you talk about physical infrastructure in terms of, uh, you know, for the transportation itself, nothing really to be done. What really needs to be done here is, uh, in my own opinion, uh, as you just said, first of all, maybe the intra-GCC uh, regulations can be a bit tailored to make sure that there is a very smooth flow of e-commerce business uh, between countries, especially when you have shortage, let's say, of products in one country, where you can buy it online and next day delivery in the other country. So it can be maybe of an open e-commerce platform as, as a region, number one, with all the facilities that come with it, be it for the taxes, uh, VATs, or customs clearance facilitations and everything else. That's what the other part is, and I have to say it as a player, and I'm ready to be the first to commit for that. Governments need to step in today after the crisis and the horrible issues that happened during the COVID-19, and you all experienced that, which is the delivery uh, crisis, 15, 20 days, uh, no more capacities, uh, companies take uh, shipments more than their existing capacities, they end up in the warehouses, customers struggle, some of these are very essentials for people, you know, you had essentials because you're locked down, you cannot go to the mall. I think personally, there should be a 360 degrees assessment for every six company to see number one, are they overselling? Are they able to handle capacities during crises? There should be a plan B and a plan C in case tomorrow, God forbid, COVID-20, COVID-21 comes back. What will governments do to ensure that people who are stuck at home and being forced to have lockdowns to at least receive what they want on time in a proper way? And if they receive on time in a proper way, they also need a proper communications channels with those courier companies who are very much overloaded and, you know, spikes of orders are unprecedented and, and, and such things. So there's a lot to be worked on regulating more this industry to make sure that if I get a license or my license is renewed, I have to tick a couple of boxes that will flag me as a good player. Saudi Arabia today, you see this by the CITC. They're doing a great job, for example, in regulating for your companies. And they penalize you if you oversell capacities or if you don't deliver on time. And the last thing here is technology. Maybe, maybe just an idea. Why can't when the authorities that license for new courier companies to, cut, to put one of the conditions at least so that they can filter the market and have only the advanced players playing, why can't you have the minimum technology required to have a proper customer experience? You don't need an Excel sheet company anymore 
to come and deliver parcels in a very horrible way. So maybe some minimal requirements or to upgrade the minimal requires, requirements. So open a courier company will clean the market, will filter the market, will prepare the region for the next level of uh, ground logistics. Uh, thank you, Hossam. I'd like to move uh, with you on the same same topic. Is where do you see the urgency of government involvement, uh, and uh, more on a general base on the uh, infrastructure building or the architecture regional building for the logistics sector? Uh, always with a, a, a having a tech uh, in mind. No, that's right. I think that there are, you know, in simple terms, two main axes. Of course, there's the, the physical infrastructure, and maybe I can talk about that in a second, but also the soft infrastructure, which is very important. And I think Hussein touched upon that in, uh, slightly. Uh, and I think it's it's empowering the digital logistics end-to-end. -end. So there, there should be, literally, if, if our ambition is to, to have a seamless logistics ecosystem in the Middle East, everything should be absolutely paperless. And this, um, and again, many countries are taking a, a crack at, uh, you know, port community systems, you know, moving on from the single window customs clearance and so on to more, you know, port community where, you know, the, 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 the value chain is digitized, you know, from the moment the goods is still in a container in a ship all the way through port customs and actually the, the hinterland, the storage, the trucking company uh, end to end until basically it goes into the city. Uh, so fantastic efforts going on on that side. Another use case that I've seen also some countries taking a crack at is really on the uh, uh, kind of uh, enforcement of the regulatory side of things in a digital manner. So stopping trucks in the middle of the road and doing these checks should be something that we, we should stop to make that flow uh, as easy as possible. Many countries have chosen to uh, you know, have certain times for, for, for trucks and, and logistics basically to come into big cities efforts like, uh, uh, you know, big city entry platforms and, and ticketing, et cetera, to make sure that we don't have crowded uh, uh, traffic situations. So this is all, I think, on the, on the soft uh, infrastructure side. Another example is, uh, for example, in the food and healthcare and then pharma, the track and trace example, right, where governments as well are in a position to have a system that, uh, in, in collaboration with the private sector, allows them to know, you know, which every single package of, of healthcare, whether it's healthcare equipment or, or medic, medical supply or, or pharma product is at every single point in time, just to make sure that we can intervene at the right time and, and save lives and, uh, and, and improve service. On the, on the hard infrastructure side, so it goes without saying, obviously upgrading the transport infrastructure is key. Uh, roads, new ports, new uh, uh, railway systems. So we see actually, as we speak, new ports coming, uh, going live, which will ease also the logistical uh, solutioning in some parts of the Middle East, which are being not uh, very well served today. The railway and the Tehad Rail in the UAE and the GCC railway network will also uh, boost uh, the logistic uh, ease of doing business here in the, in the Middle East. Uh, I'd like to add to that the intermodal integration, which is having uh, ease of, of basically taking air freight into onto logistics, onto maritime, uh, you know, dry ports within the, the country and that intermodal logistics hubs that makes it much easier, again, to a sense point, you know, when you want to ch shift goods from one country to the next, from one uh, uh, model to the next, it should be as digitized as possible. Uh, and then on the regulatory side, uh, I think it's a general comment, of course, reducing red tape and regulatory processes, et cetera, defining standards for uh, data, for the warehousing uh, world, et cetera. And on e-commerce in particular, one that's one of the key drivers of, of logistics, obviously, you know, make it as easy as possible. Uh, in one of our efforts recently, we looked at uh, in one of the GCC countries, how we can reduce, you know, the access from free zone to mainland and all the, the fees that you pay and all the permits and all the licenses, et cetera, and how we can make that as seamless as possible uh, for, for goods not to be delayed uh, at borders or at free zone uh, borders or between countries, or between transportation modes, et cetera. So that, that's in a nutshell, the different fronts I think governments can have a, a major impact on. Uh, can I just G add something quickly, Khaled? Sorry. Please go ahead. One very important point here. People are scared today of technology. The moment we come and tell them we are a very advanced tech co delivery company, they think we're expensive. So today, the key here is, I mean, we are not expensive, by the way. We are very affordable. And we don't charge, we don't pass the cost of technology to clients because our value proposition is we're tech advanced and we are enabling a better customer experience. 
you see a lot of companies today who are opening and coming with latest technologies, be it physical advanced technologies or, or, or soft technologies, and they are expensive. So this pushes back your customers and tell you, you know what? I don't care if you deliver my parcel on time uh, from Dubai to Abu Dhabi next day. I don't care if you're delivering through an electrical car, through a robot or through a hybrid uh, vehicle. They just care about delivering the package. I think today for us to encourage even customers to start looking into technology, we should not at all pass all the cost of our technological advances to them so that they can start believing in technology. And this is where the ecosystem will start really going to the next level. That's my humble opinion. Uh, JD, uh, I'd like to, to move uh, forward with you because, I mean, you ha it has been mentioned yeah, there's, there's a big friction point on the uh, border, especially terrestrial border. Uh, on your side, how, how, does, how do you see the, 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 the need for, for governments to, to enhance these points? From where we see is, we believe, you know, there should be standardization of requirements across the region, you know, building on what Dr. Hussam was saying. And, you know, governments uh, who are dealing with basically land transportation or the customs or border, it would be great to have a united uh, front in terms of decision making. You know, then, uh, you know, a lot of arbitrage, which unnecessarily happens just because of the regulatory uh, you can call it, let's say, regulatory arbitrage, right, which will kind of disappear and will make it a more level playing field. Uh, and we saw that, you know, during the COVID time and we, uh, we did a great job navigating through it, by the way. But so, for example, during the COVID times, uh, the UAE number plates uh, of trucks were not allowed to enter Saudi, but the reverse was allowed, right? So suddenly, uh, you had this asset owners in the UAE who were at a disadvantage compared to the asset owners in Saudi. So these are clearly, you know, just the, just the decision-making arbitrage, which can be solved if there is a united body. And more, more specifically, this is important for the GCC because, you know, we are almost like the United States of GCC because, you know, small countries and we are all interlinked with each other. So, uh, you know, some of these, uh, decision making where we can be united and can be much more seamless will help the overall sector. Um, you know, apart from that, I think if if you look at uh, the the things which Dr. Hussam uh, mentioned, for example, uh, innovation, you know, where where it's required, I think and I truly believe at least the governments have the right intention today. Today, uh, over the last couple of years, you know, whether you look at the customs, whether you look at the land borders, whether you look at you know, uh, various government bodies, and we ourselves are in touch with a lot of them in Saudi, in UAE, and there is a clear path of um, you know, belief where they want to take it to the next level. And a lot of them are working behind the scenes. So now the question comes that how fast can this be translated into reality, which will take some time. Complicated is a, you know, uh, sorry, logistics is a complicated uh, industry where you are dealing from, you know, the truck drivers to tr trucks, which are there for many years. And at the same time, uh, where there is a cost pressure today, given the economic conditions, you know. So we have to look, when, when we talk about, you know, improvising the quality of trucks, for example, and, you know, installing them with the, the, you know, or retrofit them with like new uh, things, right? There's always a question of return versus the investment for an asset owner. And in the times when uh, companies are focused more on their cost optimization, uh, you know, trying to reduce that price, trying to save that extra dollar from, you know, which, wherever they can, obviously the freight cost plays a very important role throughout uh, throughout their economics. And if the freight costs are under pressure, then people who are the asset owners would not be that keen on investing. And this is very much similar to an analogy of, um, or, or an example of telecom industry. If you look at telecoms, how it has evolved uh, in India, you know, the countries where it's more of an open market, as the cost of your uh, voice calls or data keeps on going down, 
the investment into the sector also goes down because you know at the end of the day these telecom giants they won't keep on investing in you know spectrums and 5g and you know 4gs unless they have a clear path to return on investment it's a very similar concept for the trucks so today as much as the governments and everyone would like to have all 2019 or 2020 trucks on the road is it really possible because 2020 trucks will have a different freight cost versus you know something which is operating uh, for last 15 years so i think there is a balancing act here which is not purely under the control of the government or just the asset owners it's also a question about uh, supply and demand it's also a question about the economic conditions and the recovery and i believe as the recovery would happen we would naturally see the acceleration of digitization because governments are clearly supportive and with that uh, economic boom which will come obviously will we see the investment in the in the newer age of vehicles would, which would be much more compliant with you know what what we want as the next uh, stage of growth i mean generally speaking it's clear that there's there's a lot of pressure on the logistics sector from the as you mentioned and hasin did as well on the 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 cost side and the competition on the cost side and the focus uh, uh, on the cost side uh, we are uh, at the a turning point where uh, climate change and you know uh, and uh, esg uh, uh, standards are are being put forward if we were to have a mandatory or regulation around certain emissions or or other or other things uh, who would pay for this at the end uh, hosam could you what is your view how i mean ca can this sector uh, take on this uh, this cost uh it's a, good, a tough question khalid you uh, if i had the answer <laughs> no but i think it's it's a, it's a clear trend and i think even uh, you know in the past it has been kind of personal uh, you know driven by kind of activists and individual uh, investors and now it has moved on to become uh, a kind of no re a trend of no return even for institutional investors who are betting on the ESG trends etc so i think it, it is there and also with the geopolitical changes in the in the aftermath of the us elections uh, So the direction is clear uh, and I think uh, you know th these policies will also come to our region at, at some point to comply with our overall uh, global standards. So it, it is part of doing uh, cost of doing uh, business. Uh, it, it has to be embedded in the calculations and I'm sure Sane and JD as part of their business planning they're, they're somehow preempting this in a way or another maybe not tomorrow but uh, down the line. So in my view and this is my personal humble opinion uh, it is a trend it has to be taking care of and uh, probably in our region not with the media effect but mid term and long term it's definitely part of the business okay uh, we're, we're going to move we have some some question because we were approaching the the hour so uh, I'll I'll move to the the first question is is addressed to Hassan so uh, any last mile success story examples currently that may include technology providers like yourself and a logistics provider well yes i think i have a nice uh story to tell about the covid-19 that was during april almost uh, how technology helped us to maintain our, our commitments and service level agreements against the big players because when i told you that everybody almost in the region were delivering within two weeks to three weeks for a parcel that takes a 15 a 15 minutes uh, uh, driving distance uh, what made us really uh, successful and delivering within one or two days without any with zero tolerance to anything beyond that that it wasn't really an added problem was our technology why because our tech controls our delivery capacity so today when we agree with a client that they have 1000 parcels a day our system will will utilize will will uh, so will analyze our delivery capacity which is very valuable every day you know a lot of orders come and then it can block capacity for every client as a commitment to that customer without taking anything additional from any other clients that can put pressure on my operations which means this is where i didn't uh, chew more what i can digest as a company i was able to maintain my service levels okay it's maybe a bit less revenue but less revenue is better than losing a lot of money uh, when when you can't deliver 
and it picked up uh, parcels. So technology helped us a lot in optimizing the operation and allowing us to deliver on time while controlling our delivery capacities and predicting what, what shipments can come today. And this is where I think we did a great job. There's, there's another question, but it, we, we uh, uh, answered it because around the uh, legal, uh, legal aspects of, uh, of things. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask JT uh, a question in terms of, you know, building, uh, founding your startup, building it, uh, and the need to, to grow. Uh, what would you say uh, is the biggest challenge in terms of uh, discussions with uh, investors uh, around the, 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 uh, the particular logistics tech sector? Look, I think logistics as an overall, uh, it's not a very difficult uh, sector to sell today because, you know, anyone who understands how big of a logistics opportunity is in the region, I think everyone pretty much knows this is, a, this is the focus area for the next 20, 10, 20 years. The sector is growing year on year, as Dr. Hussam uh, pointed it out. So as a sector, everyone kind of believes in it. I think what investors like to see from different companies who are emerging into this is the execution capability. I will go back to the point which I was alluding today, you know, the ability to start a company is not that difficult. You know, ability to build something from the technology point of view, again, is not very difficult. But the ability to show that you can truly execute and scale is extremely hard. You know, there were multiple companies also which came into the similar sector like ours in the region, but there are not many who are standing today. Whereas we are in Pakistan, in UAE, in Saudi, we are serving almost 12, 13 countries, almost all the countries in the Middle East. So this execution capability, I mean, similarly in last mile, right? There were so many players which came in, not everyone is standing today. So uh, the, the barriers to entry is low, but barriers to scale is high. And I think, you know, it's your own question about how fast do you want to grow? Obviously, as a startup, we all want to, you know, switch the gears and move on a very accelerated pace. Uh, but, you know, you, you want to make sure you don't break things while you're growing, right? You are, you are cautiously and growing in a controlled manner. Uh, and really, and, and, and this kind of ties up with your ESG, right? When we talk about ESG, what is it? It's about environmental, right? It's about social, which is towards your own colleagues, employees, etc., as well, and towards your governance as well, right? You don't want to be uh, flying very high and suddenly you put yourself in a situation where, you know, all the stakeholders associated with you, whether it's your colleagues or team members or whoever gets into trouble. So we have been very, very careful about it. And that has really helped us to navigate through, you know, very, very uncertain crisis, like, for example, pandemic, which was the worst crisis over 100 years, to navigate through it beautifully, right? Keeping the whole team intact, you know, so doing our, playing the part of our social responsibility towards our, you know, colleagues. And it is that execution which gave us the faith to go and launch our business in Pakistan today. So I think this kind of all ties up and it's a question to each company in terms of how they want to grow and, you know, when they, do they want to bring in investors at what level. But I think overall as a sector, investors are very, very interested in this. They all understand, you know, it's a, it's a growing sector and Middle East is an amazing place for, uh, for the growth. Great. Uh, I mean, I think it was, we, 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 we touched on all, uh, all the points and um, there's, there's uh, answered all the, the, the questions. So, uh, I'll, I'll thank you all for participating and thank you for, for attending and uh, looking forward to uh, other discussions uh, around the, the sector and wishing you all the best and I will close the session now.